the biggest shift that people are gonna need to make in 2024, it's a mindset shift. We are living in a world of constant change. And from both a personal and a professional perspective, a mindset shift is imperative in replacing dysfunctional beliefs with more productive ones. And I said to myself for 2023, forget all the financial goals and things I want to achieve, which are still there. For me, success will be finishing this year strong, not crawling, not on my knees, but standing tall. That shift that I've been able to make, it's not an easy one. It is not an easy one. The mental challenge every single time outweighs the physical and the emotional. So I have a question for you. Who do you need to be at the end of 2024? And what is the mindset you need to make that will help you get there? Welcome to the last episode of the Everyday Leadership for 2023. A couple of months ago, I wrote a quote which said, as you pursue your objectives to close the year with vigor, aspire not only to achieve them, but to do so standing tall, not crawling on weary knees. The real accomplishment is in the enduring stride, not just the finish line. I wrote that quote because this time last year, probably another 10 or so days time, I was in Canada. I was coming back home after what should feel like such a euphoric year. We had managed to move house, which in itself was an absolute miracle because so many different things went wrong. But we moved house. We had a lot of work done to the house in that same period of time as well. And there were other wins that my wife had had, that the family had had. And honestly, I should be buzzing end of the year, goal smashed, so amazing. But I wasn't. Here I was in an airport, in the snow, it's Canada. Tired and drained and just could not wait to get home. And that's when I wrote that quote. And I said to myself for 2023, Forget all the financial goals and things I want to achieve, which were still there. For me, success will be finishing this year strong, not crawling, not on my knees, but standing tall. And that's why we haven't had a podcast for the last two weeks. I've had so much on in terms of getting this 100-day devotional out, dealing with logistics and so many other issues that I just did not recognize were going to be problem. That I said, I could put something out, but it won't be something that I can fully stand behind. And also, I had to ask myself, who is driving you to do this? Who says you can't take a break? Who says you can't chill when you need to? So part of the aim for the podcast and the work that I do is not just to coach these things or teach these things in workshops but to actual model what it looks like and feels like and I can tell you right now when I made that decision not to release anything for the last two weeks at first I was like oh what are you doing that's going to mess up with algorithm that's going to mess with so many different fears and insecurities came into my head and that ended up with so what's the worst that could happen that's it Every single time those insecurity kids in my head, I ask myself, so what's the worst that could happen? And nothing did. The world didn't stop. People carried on doing what they were doing. And I was able to do what I needed to do without stressing myself out, without feeling the need of feeling obliged to deliver something when I didn't need to. And that mindset that shift that I've been able to make it's not an easy one it is not an easy one (laughs) but it's taking some time and it's necessary and even though this is the last podcast of the year it really really leans well into what I want to talk about as we end So one of the things that I have noticed based on the work I have done 
just not just this year, but in particular the last um, four or five months, is the biggest shift that people are going to need to make in 2024. It's a mindset shift. That's not just because it's the name of my company and it sounds nice. It's bigger than that. We are living in a world of constant change. And from both a personal and a professional perspective, a mindset shift is imperative in replacing dysfunctional beliefs with more productive ones. Ones that change the options that we consider. Ones that might even change our identity. Now, the mindset shift is not easy. It takes time. Again, when I work with my clients, I work with them typically for 12 months at a minimum because it takes time to really change, to unlearn, to relearn. And it can also be painful. But it is necessary. I want to use two examples. I want to use this one from a professional perspective. And it's one I don't often talk about. One I, I actually dismissed a lot and I kind of parked it when I left that side of things. But one that uh, a friend who recently died challenged me on. And he was the only one that had ever challenged me on this. So I used to lead turnaround projects for companies. In that period of time, I made over a billion dollars for those places, for those companies. Now, leading turnaround projects is not easy. And they are a very good example of a mindset shift. See, me coming into that world, as you can imagine, it's already highly stressful. They're already not making money. They are losing a lot of money. So there are people who are very scared of what's going to happen to them. Are they going to get to keep their jobs? And it goes all the way up. Especially when it's like a major flagship product. You can imagine it's highly pressurized. Not just pressurized for those who are already in that environment. But pressurized for someone like me. The first project I came into, that was the first time I led a turnaround project. And the only reason I was able to do that and come into that was because someone had known me, uh, one of the senior VPs had known me from back in the day when I still love commercial work. And he's like, this is not going well. My shop is someone who, who comes in and sees a bigger picture and helps just analyze and change things in so many different ways. Yes, he has a finance background, but he's strategic, he's operational. He mixes in so many different crowds. He'll be great. That's how I got the job. Outside, I was like, yes, great money, great location, all that good stuff. Inside, I was like, Lord, what am I going to do? How am I going to handle this? But I was prepared for this. I had the gifts and talents to step into, and I did. The organization, however, was not prepared for my approach. So you, you will think in that type of environment, someone's going to come in, all guns blazing, changing everything. Go, 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 go. I opted for something slightly different. I opted for something that I advise a lot of my clients who step into the C-suite um, to do around the first 90 days and take that first 30 days and just slow things down for a minute. Things have already been stressful. It's not going to get any worse. They're already going to keep on losing money. So you coming in, like, rushing through, like, a day in headlights trying to prove a point, it's not what they need. They need someone who can come in and just calm things down, bring that level of fear and anxiety all the way down. Someone who can actually ask them questions that they can answer based on their logical brain, not their fair brain. And that's what I did. I went into that environment, had a lot of questions. Did they make changes straight away? Got to know the internal moving um, parties. And I say moving parties because they kept on changing. And there were multiple like design, engineering, um, manufacturing, and then supply chain, which was vast. They had a supply chain not just based in the UK, it was based all around the world. And they had an external client had to get to know them and their moving project manager team and so much stuff. It was a lot. And as I got to know the different bits and pieces, rather than doing the tried and tested, 
personally, I find boring. I decided to do something different. I said the organization, this organization needs a mindset shift. This is the project I'm going to help to showcase why that is. It was a massive risk. It was a massive, massive risk. Because if it didn't go well, that was me and my career done. Career that was just getting started. But I went from everything's so rigid. Let's start to do some experiments. Let's move away from having a very controlling environment to a more empowered one where people can ask questions, where people can push back. And what we learned was there's so many people with hidden talents. There were so many people whose talents were not being tapped into that could have helped turn this project around in remarkable ways. Like, let's throw out the rule book. And as good and great as it sounds, see, people always say we want to throw out the rule book. We want to reduce red tape. When you do it, people get scared. A lot of them don't know what to do and how to act and how to operate. They've been so used and accustomed, even though they didn't like it, to being told what to do and how to do and how to think. When you actually ask them for their opinion, they're like, what? Say what now? <laughs> it takes them a little while for it just to land and for it to get. Like, you really want to hear what I have to say? What do I have to say? Because I've forgotten what it is. It's already been buried under all this different chaos and micromanagement but that's what i did we had conversations we will run um project management meetings till late and then more this were days when i was working 15 16 hour days my wife would tell you that it was it was long days but rather than me coming in with all my ideas i was like no let's everyone share the idea i went last rather than me going first which was typical i went last i listened connected which is a skill set of mine I was able to extrapolate stuff again, a major skill set of mine. So even in what seemed like me not giving them ideas, I was able to pull the different threads together because I was playing to my strengths. And then we executed. And we'll try something that didn't work. And they were, they were expecting that blame to come down. I was like, okay, no, we'll try that. It doesn't work out. Let's do it this way. And it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of pressure. We turned it around, we made um, over 250 million and that project I was losing 100 million already in their original forecast. So as you can imagine, everyone was euphoric. The CEO, the C-suite, they got their bonus on Pat. It actually helped the company overall as a global company, helped the company overall in so many different ways. They were able to build some great relationships with our client partner. It was a great, great, great experience. But that all came about because they had a mindset shift. Because we had to flip things around. We couldn't keep on doing what we had always done. And that is the problem. Companies are saying, we want to adapt new technologies, i.e. AI is an example. We want to hire great, talented staff. We want them to come with, especially that next generation, when they come with their energy. Yet your culture is stuck in a very fixed mindset way of doing things. Your culture doesn't actually ask for feedback, and when it does, just ticks an exercise. It's just a tick in the box exercise, and you keep it moving. You don't appreciate people for who they are and what they bring. Instead, you want them to assimilate. Those are traits that the next generation don't want. There's a trait of a culture that will stagnate eventually. It might not happen right now. It will happen. People want to be listened to. People want to be heard. People want to be acknowledged. People want to just have a sense of purpose in what they do. It's not just about the money. Again, I work with some clients who was so used to using the money, 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 money approach with their people that when they had a really bad year, which for a lot of people in 2023 was a really bad year, and they couldn't use that, they didn't know how to motivate their people. They didn't know what else to do. They didn't know about being able to connect with people and really understand what's driving you. Can I give you more responsibility? Can I even promote you without necessarily getting the financial rewards, which I know sucks. I've been there myself. But... There are still other things that we can do to help you show that you are making progress, make you feel like you're making progress. Not just feel it, actually give you a title that you are making progress. 
Because we can't reward you with money right now, but we can give you other things. But from other people, it was stepping into new projects. It was moving across departments. There were so many different things that they didn't know how to do, which are basics. Or so you think. That's the mindset shit I'm talking about. That took a lot of time to unravel and unwrap in these different teams and cultures I was working in. And for 2024, it's only going to get bigger. You need to have a mindset shift around the changes that you want to fully take on and experience the growth, the productivity, the richness of culture. A psychological safety piece that comes with all of that comes with a mindset shift. That's a professional lens. That is a professional lens. A personal one. See, our minds play a very, very, very powerful role in our beliefs and thoughts. What we think about ourselves and our abilities decide how we act and how we lead ourselves, how we lead from the inside out. You know my favorite phrases. The only reason I had the audacity to be able to step into those projects I talked about was faith and mindset. My attitude of curiosity and that we can figure things out with a with a hint of boldness and courage and I'm gonna say stupidity as well. Help me believe I could accomplish things I never done before. That was internal to me. That was internal to me. And then I took that and I just spread that fragrance all the way all the way around internal and external people I worked with. And they started to buy into that. They started to change their minds. They started to step into that. That's the internal piece that is key for you as a company but for you as an individual this year i did a 500k charity bike ride now initially i was just going to say this year i rode a road bike and that'll be the end of that because that in itself is an accomplishment i have never been on a road bike before i actually think it was stupid but this year, I signed up to a family keg um, challenge in Ghana. I'd been on the road bike four times. Four times in the UK. Apart from that, I've been training my peloton. And the last month before I went to Ghana, I had COVID. So I was, I couldn't, I could not train. It was really, really bad. So bear in mind, I've never been on a road bike before. You're doing 500k which is a lot, different road conditions, different um, weather conditions, just full stop different country. You haven't trained that much. I haven't been in best possible training. And I did this thing. <laughs> it sounds absolutely suicidal. And it felt like it was. Physically and emotionally, I was drained. I was spent. I was done. But mentally, which is why I signed up in the first place, mentally, I had to learn to push myself past that limit of giving up. The mental challenge every single time, every single time outweighs the physical and the emotional. That's the muscle you need to learn to lift on a regular basis. And a lot of us do not do that. One of the mantras that I that helped me get through that period of time, I used to say to myself, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, and stop to the end. One, two, then stop to the end. I got that from my Peloton training. So I didn't feel like that training set me up. In a sense, it did. Physically, did it. Mentally, it did. I had things I could pull on. But also, one thing I also want to say is a lot of times when we step into new things and it's unsure and we feel unsteady and we're trying to find our feet, there's so much more you've already been through in your life that you can fall back on to help you. know, If I got through that, I can, go, I can get through this. I relied heavily on the fact that I hated running and yet I have run a marathon and I've done a couple of half marathons and running became a major part of my life for many, many years. 
I can pull on that bank. It's that um, quote from Maya Angelou when she says, when you walk into a room, walk into a room with your ancestors on your back. That quote has it's always hit me. Because part of what we did, actually, when we were in Ghana, is we went to the Asamanso slave market, um, River site. This is where a lot of Nigerians and Ghanaians who had walked hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles, suffered abuse, were starved, beaten um, by those who were driving them all the way throughout. These were people who were often attacked by wild animals, were used and just thrown to the wolves, literally thrown to the wolves so that other people could get through. They were unable to fight. They were unable to run because they were shackled and chained through all that ordeal. And they made it through. I saw some of those chains. I held some of those chains, the lighter ones, and they were heavy. I can't imagine having to walk hundreds and hundreds of miles shackles of someone else with no food, no water, fearing for your life with the animals around you. And they made it through. And then they made it to the Samantha River, which is where they took their, their last bath. But those who did make it at that point in time, because some of them were killed, took their last, bath, their last bath, and then they were sold all across the world. The mindset it would have taken for them to get through that ordeal that's what you carry when you go with your ancestors on your back as a black person. That's what I carry with me. That experience as our guide took us through their ordeal and explained it all and then we walked down to the river. When I felt like quitting, I remember that. I remember them. See, researchers already caught up with what we already know. Your mindset plays a significant role in determining your life's outcome. I'm recording this in a studio that in my diary, I think it was about four or five years ago, I remember writing because I was trying to have a meeting. It was raining. I was in a plastic shed. I couldn't hear anyone. And I was so depressed. And I said, Lord, I want to build an office at the back of my house that I can also have as a studio space. All the actions I took from me <laughs> making that commitment and declaration to, to God, to where we are right now, they all had the iterations of mindset shifts that I had to make and pain that I had to go through to get to the purpose. Your mindset plays a significant role in determining your life's outcome. And it's going to be key for you in 2024. Those sets of beliefs that shape how you make a sense of the world and how you make sense of who you are. Because your mindset influences how you think, how you feel, how you behave in any given situation. It means that while you're writing down your goals for 2024, while you're recapping your 2023, are you thinking, truly thinking about the things you need to change to help you achieve your goal? How much of the noise of the world, your family, your friends, are you letting permeate a boundary that I hope you have created? Because if you have not created a boundary, then you need to do that first. The more that you can understand, adapt, and shift your mindset, it pays dividends for you personally, health, wealth, spirituality, emotions, everything. Decreases your stress, makes you more resilient, then there's a multiplier effect to those in your immediate circle. And that could be your family. That could be your partner. That could be your kids. That could be just your friends. And then to the work that you do in the world. 
There's a multiplying effect. So I have a question for you. Who do you want to be at the end of 2024? And what is the mindset shift that you need to make that will help you get there? I'm not talking about resolution that you're going to break in less than a week, which 80% of people fail them. I'm just talking about who do you need to grow into to allow you to become the person you need to be to achieve the goals that you have for the end of the year. You might say, I don't set any goals. That's great. But you still need to grow as an individual because if you can't just stay who you are, if you stay who you are, you are just living and not thriving. I was bringing back, can you use an example of marriage? I am madly in love with my wife because we create the time to be constantly reintroduced to who we are both becoming. She is growing. I am growing. And if I stayed the same, I'll be a complete stranger to her. If she stayed the same, she'd be a complete stranger to me. But because we are both growing, it makes it fun because you're constantly meeting someone new. That takes time. And that growth happens at different phases as well. And sometimes what you're going into doesn't always suit the next person and they will sometimes need to let you know. You'd be like, well, it starts a whole different conversation. But that's, again, part of the communication piece. Who do you need to be at the end of 2024? And what is the mindset you need to make that will help you get there? It's been a pleasure being with you all on this podcast over the past year. I look forward to many more episodes, to many more guests, and to seeing you grow and become a better everyday leader as you lead from the inside out to the outside in. Have a blessed break with your friends, with your family. Have a good new year. We'll see you on the other side.